really happy to introduce Sri Ram to everyone. He's going to be talking about one particular area of his research. Um, but Sri Ram, in, in general, is interested in multi-agent systems, thinking about um, things like how do these systems scale, how do they work empirically, but also what can we actually prove about the, the performance of these systems. Sri Ram just recently got his PhD um, from uh, Waterloo, and now he is looking at different op options for a postdoc. So with that, I'll hand it over to Sri Ram to talk about decentralized mean field games. Yeah, so I guess everyone can hear me and see my slides. Yep, you look good. Very good, very good. Thank you, thank you for the introduction, Matt and, and Neeraj. Uh, yes, so decentralized mean field games. Um, so I'm here to talk about our recent AAA I work. Uh, this just got accepted to AAA I 22. Uh, so let me just uh, briefly mention my co-authors. Of course, Matt uh, Taylor is a part of this uh, work and he is a professor at the University of Alberta and he's also affiliated with Amy. Uh, Mark Crowley uh, is a professor at the University of Waterloo. Uh, Pascal Poupart is a professor at the University of Waterloo and a faculty member at the Vector Institute. Uh, myself, I'm also affiliated with the University of Waterloo and the Vector Institute. Right. Uh, so the outline of my talk today is going to uh, take this uh, format that I'm uh, presenting in this slide. First, I will uh, introduce the problem that I'm interested in. And then I will talk about a particular technique in literature called mean field learning. This is like a very interesting uh, and novel uh, technique. Uh, so I will formally introduce this technique. And then I will talk about a, a, a particular paradigm, a mean field paradigm that we introduce in our work, and it's called decentralized mean field games. Uh, I'll present some theoretical results about this paradigm. I will talk about a practical implementation technique. I'll talk about some empirical results, and then I'll finally conclude using uh, some points of conclusion and, and uh, some avenues for future work. Okay, so uh, if we uh, look at the general paradigm of reinforcement learning, uh, it is typically seen as the single agent paradigm where you have a, a single agent which has agency, which can decide on uh, choosing actions and almost everything else is a part of the environment. Uh, but in the real world, it's very rarely the case that you have your own agent which has some agency and it can decide actions and everything else is just part of the world. I mean, that's that's very rare. Uh, most of the real world environments are multi-agent. I present uh, some multi-agent environments in this slide, which I am interested in. Uh, something like logistic operations, that's like demand and supply. You have a bunch of uh, consumers who have some demands and then you have some suppliers who uh, supply this demand to the consumers. Uh, something like right pool matching, where you have a bunch of um, uh, taxi drivers and then you have a bunch of uh, passengers who place requests on a system and the system has to efficiently match the or taxi drivers to the passengers. And something like wildfire fighting. I mean, like wildfire fighting is uh, really does not need any introduction. Uh, it, wildfire has become a very huge problem in the world today. And fighting and taming these wildfires is typically a multi-agent problem where many different uh, firefighters are involved. Uh, so one nice technique that can be applied to all of these uh, situations is multi-agent reinforcement learning. And this is can be seen as an extension of the single agent reinforcement learning paradigm to uh, environments that have multiple agents. And uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning has had some really good, interesting successes in the last decade. I, I mean, in the last decade, we have seen reinforcement learning has some really great successes, and multi-agent reinforcement learning has had some interesting successes as well. So we have seen uh, superhuman performances in a, a really hard uh, video game of Dota 2, and we have seen uh, the uh, um, uh, an autonomous agent uh, defeat the best Go player in the world, Lee Sidol. Uh, and we have also started seeing multi-agent algorithms slowly being implemented implemented in small settings in the real world uh, where you have like uh, where you use robots for warehouse optimization and management. Uh, so one observation is that all of these successes have typically uh, two to 10 agents. So these are all settings with small numbers of agents. Uh, what I am trying to do is trying to extend the success of multi-agent algorithms, multi-agent reinforcement learning algorithms, uh, to be uh, uh, to be used and to be able to tackle uh, domains that I have in the in the top here. So I I want to see multi-agent algorithms in logistic operations. I want to see them in right pool matching, wildfire fighting, and so on. Uh, so the question now is why can't we simply just use what we have? You know, just 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 implement what you have uh, directly in these domains. Uh, unfortunately, that's uh, not possible. Uh, because uh, when you try to implement multi-agent algorithms to all of these uh, hard domains, you will find out that uh, many of these uh, um, the many of these multi-agent algorithms are not tractable in these domains. And the reason is that uh, multi-agent reinforcement learning is typically exponential in the number of agents in both uh, time and space complexity. Typically, that's that's what we observe. 
Right. Uh, so before coming back to the problem of scaling and multi-agent reinforcement learning, uh, let me just formally introduce uh, uh, in a high level at least what multi-agent reinforcement learning is all about. So when we see a, a talk in reinforcement learning, we have this, most people have uh, this basic reinforcement learning slide where uh, there is this figure uh, where you have one agent that interacts with the environment and, and obtains, um, uh, provides an action and obtains some weak signals called rewards. Uh, but I have a different slide. Uh, uh, pertaining to multi-agent reinforcement learning because that is going to be the focus of my uh, talk today. Uh, so multi-agent reinforcement learning can be seen as this field, which is in the intersection of multi-agent games and sequential decision making. So multi-agent games spans the uh, field of game theory where you have two or more agents, uh, at least two agents, and each of these agents can choose an action uh, from its action space. And the joint action of all of these agents informs a particular payoff that all of these agents get. And given the payoff and the joint action, it is typical to calculate an equilibrium strategy where every agent is providing the best response to every other agent in the environment. Uh, the other field of interest is sequential decision making, uh, uh, also known as reinforcement learning. So in reinforcement learning, you have an agent uh, Typically, reinforcement learning is seen as a single agent paradigm. So you have one agent, and this agent is interacting with the environment, providing uh, an action in response to the state of the environment and obtaining some weak signals called rewards from the environment. Uh, once the environment executes this action in the uh, uh, in this particular state, uh, the environment sequentially transitions to a new state, and uh, this entire process sequentially uh, keeps being continued for many, many iterations. Uh, so multi-agent reinforcement learning's architecture can be provided uh, based on this slide. So we have n agents, where n is greater than or equal to 2, and each agent obtains a state or observation from the environment and each agent chooses an action, and the joint action of all of these agents informs a reward function of each of these agents. And when this joint action is executed in the environment, uh, the entire system sequentially transitions to a new state. And again, this entire process keeps continuing for many, many iterations. So multi-agent reinforcement learning has to be seen as uh, a new field, its own unique field, uh, with its own unique uh, challenges and opportunities that is different from its constituent areas of uh, multi-agent games and sequential decision making. Okay, let's, let's come back to the problem of scaling and multi-agent reinforcement learning. So this problem has been investigated by prior uh, authors. So this problem has been uh, uh, capturing the attention of uh, uh, researchers for quite some time now. So I'm going to talk about three popular ways in which prior work has, has approached uh, the, the issue of scaling multi-agent reinforcement learning. Uh, and I'm also gonna talk about some pros and cons of these techniques. And then I'm going to say uh, that I'm gonna choose one of these techniques and with, with reasons for why I'm interested in one of these three techniques. Uh, so the first technique uh, that people are really interested in is independent methods. So independent method is this um, uh, technique of just assuming, uh, so just assuming every other agent in the environment to simply be part of the state. So there is no particular modeling of other agents performed. Uh, so you have one agent and that agent is just assuming everything's a part of the state and just trying to provide the best response to the state. And the state also includes all the other agents in the environment. So the, the good uh, part about this uh, method is that it's really easy to implement and uh, we've got uh, we've, we've got some good experience in single agent reinforcement learning. We know uh, we have lots of algorithms, sir. We know which algorithms work well, which algorithms don't work well. Uh, so, you know, just, just try your DQNs and PPOs and, and see what happens in the multi-agent method. So that's, that's really easy to implement and uh, and we also have some, some background knowledge uh, that we can make use of. Uh, but the, the, the con of this method is that it's very hard to provide any theoretical guarantees in, uh, for independent methods, uh, simply because uh, this kind of uh, hurts the Markovian assumptions and Markovian properties and reinforcement learning methods. Uh, so uh, I would not go as far as saying no theoretical guarantees. Uh, you can actually provide, there are, there are some works that provide some theoretical guarantees in some very limited, uh, highly restrictive settings, but uh, for most practical purposes, let's let's just say there is no theoretical guarantees. Uh, and the other problem with scaling model is that uh, uh, in in uh, in uh, independent methods, when it's used in model for for settings where you're trying to scale, people have found that uh, independent methods don't work that well. And also, people have found that independent methods empirically don't work well in, in many settings. So this is uh, still an open problem. We don't know clearly where it works well and where it does not well. In some, in some places, it does work well. But in some places, it does not work well as well. Uh, so here, I, I provide three graphs in this slide where uh, these three graphs pertain to a particular multi-agent environment called Gaussian squeeze. Uh, 
And this was the, from the work of Yang et al. in 2018. So if you see across these three slide, uh, these three graphs, uh, Yang et al. has uh, scaled the number of agents from 100 to 500 to 1,000. And uh, the first three uh, algorithms here, IL, FMQ, and REC, FMQ, all these three are uh, independent methods. So for example, if you take the red curve, the red curve gives you good performance for n equal to 100, but the red curve does not give you very good performances when n is equal to 500 or n is equal to 1000. So independent methods don't really scale that well in, in most environments. Uh, so that is a little counterintuitive, but there's still needs more uh, investigation for why this is the case. Uh, the second method that is really popular in literature is this uh, paradigm of CTD, centralized training and decentralized execution. So, um, the approach in CDD is to uh, just assume that all the agents can uh, be trained in, in some kind of a simulator during training. And during training, all the agents have access to global information. And uh, after all the training is completed, the agents are uh, implemented in the uh, practical environments. And when they are implemented, uh, they are going to be decentralized. And now they don't have access to any global information. So this is another widely studied paradigm. It is well understood in literature. Uh, but one problem is that uh, I feel personally that CTD is not very practical. So it's very hard to come up with practical settings where CTD can, can be used because it's very hard to come up with arguments where you can say that all the training can be done in the lab under centralized uh, assumptions and then go back to the field and, and, and implement in a very decentralized way. Uh, again, empirical performance is poor when you try to scale. Uh, this uh, work from Yang et al. is one example that shows that. Uh, MAAC, here this yellow curve, uh, is actually a CTD method and uh, it does well when n is equal to 100, but if you say n is equal to 500 or n is equal to 1000, the the curve is just flat, so CTD doesn't work well. So the third method is mean field learning. So this is uh, a very uh, interesting approach, which actually gives you the best empirical performances in most domains when you try to scale. Uh, so again, in this figure, if you see uh, the methods that give you good performances in n equal to 500 and n equal to 1000 are this purple line and this blue line. And both of these lines uh, pertain to MFQ and MFAC, both of which are mean field techniques. One is mean field Q learning and the other is mean field active critique. Um, so mean field learning uh, has good empirical performances, but one problem with mean field learning is that they've got some uh, mean field methods in, in prior work have some lots of uh, limiting assumptions. So these limiting assumptions uh, prevent the wider use of mean field learning. Uh, the, 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 uh, there is another point, which is both of a pro and a con in uh, mean field learning. That is the theoretical groundedness of mean field learning. So mean field learning has good theoretical properties. Uh, in fact, it has better theoretical properties than the first two techniques, independent learning and CTD. Uh, but uh, these theoretical properties are largely provided under some impractical assumptions and impractical settings. So that is a, a particular con of uh, mean field learning. Uh, so uh, this work, so this talk that I'm going to give and this work that uh, we got accepted to play AI is all about relaxing these limiting assumptions and also providing theoretical guarantees under more practical considerations. Uh, so the three points that I'm going to hammer again and again during this talk is uh, scaling of model, uh, under less restrictive assumptions and under theoretical uh, properties, which are more practical. So practical theoretical properties, scaling, less assumptions. These are the three important points that I'm going to keep uh, bringing up during the rest of this talk. All right. So now let, let me say a little bit more about mean field learning. So uh, one observation that you have in uh, large environments with many, many agents is that uh, an individual agent's impact is kind of negligible. Uh, a good example where uh, uh, mean field learning has uh, is, is been successful is this icing model uh, that has been uh, released in, uh, this is a big model in physics uh, where uh, people have used the icing model to study properties of ferromagnetism. And this model has actually been introduced in 1925, which is, it's, it's actually a classic uh, uh, model of study in, in physics. Uh, so the model uh, studies the relation between atomic spins of different atoms in a lattice to the, and, 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 and uh, correlates these atomic spins to the energy of the lattice. So when all the atoms uh, choose actions, uh, choose spins that are similar to its neighbors, the overall energy of the lattice is going to reduce. Uh, so because you have lots and lots of atoms in this particular lattice, uh, it's easier to uh, uh, use something like mean field learning, or it is better to use something like mean field learning, which can scale. Uh, 
so the mean field approximation uh, is a uh, uh, actually is a technique that can reduce um, the mini agent problem to a two agent problem so you can think of this uh, mean field approximation as some kind of a plug in or some kind of a switch that you can just switch on and that will um, uh, just just convert this environment into uh, an equivalent environment which has only only two agents instead of all the all the all the different agents in the environment and the second agent over here so one agent is yourself and the second agent to over here is actually uh, something called as a mean field so there is it's, it's some distribution about the population uh, so to provide one example, so if you look at this uh, circle over here, we have got like about uh, seven or eight red agents, and each of these red agents is responding to uh, something called as a mean field, which is like a virtual agent uh, represented by the green circle, and uh, each of these agents do not formulate strategies uh, uh, pertaining to uh, trying to respond to the other agents in the environment, rather they only try to respond to the mean field. So now you see that uh, the mean field approximation is useful in providing uh, tractable solutions because all the multi-agent hour techniques that you have from the shelf can now be just applied uh, to this environment with lots and lots of agents by just using the mean field as the second agent instead of using all the other agents in the environment. Uh, so there is a second important property here, which is that uh, we can retain some system essentials. Uh, so this is a mathematical guarantee that you provide where the mean field approximation uh, gives you an approximation error between the mean field as well as the actual learning without the mean field. And this approximation is inversely proportional to the number of agents. So uh, when the number of agents goes to infinity in the limit or when the number of agents is very high, you can actually show that the mean field approximation, uh, the approximation error goes to zero. So therefore there is no approximation error when you have many, many agents, right? So we have a question. Yes, yes Ram. Uh, I hope you can hear me. <laughs> Um, yes. I, I have a I have a question about the setup to begin mm -hmm. with. Um, let me see if I can how, how to ask this. Are we concerned with the question of I am deploying an agent into a multi-agent setting? There are many other agents in the environment, but mm -hmm. but I'm wondering what should this agent do, or am I worried about maybe I'll say I yeah maybe the other way to look at this is I'm a mechanism designer. Mm -hmm. who is thinking about a large scale system that has many agents in it. And I want to try to understand what should the agents in that system do? It's more from the first Where perspective. I'm not, you think it's, it's more from the first perspective? It's more of the first perspective? Yeah, so you deploy an agent here in this environment with lots and lots of agents. And I'm trying to learn policies for this agent that 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 uh, learns, uh, that that is able to perform efficiently. Okay, I'm, I might have a follow-up question, but I'll wait to see where this goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think a few of the slides, the next few slides should clarify this point. All right, okay, thanks. So yeah, so the mean field approximation, like I said, uh, allows you to do two things. Allows you to give you give you tractable solutions and as well as retain system essentials from the mean field approximation perspective. Right, so do we have any other questions so far? Oh, good. Uh, so before I go into uh, explaining what the mean field setup is all about, let me just uh, say a couple of things about MDPs and stochastic games, which is the underlying mathematical formulations. Uh, so I'm, I'm assuming that most of you are familiar with MDPs. Uh, MDPs can be represented as the stuple uh, of five different variables, where S represents the state space, A represents the action space, R represents the reward function, T is a transition function, and gamma is a discount factor. So this pertains to a single agent environment. You have a single agent, and uh, the agent state and action is represented by S and A respectively. Now, when you move to the multi-agent setting, especially uh, from the stochastic game perspective, uh, now you have uh, the important things that are changed are shown in red. So now you have a shared state space. So this is considered like the global state space, uh, which contains all the information, as much information as needed to make this environment Markovian. Uh, and then you have uh, uh, AJ, which represents the action space of a particular agent J. Uh, typically, the uh, uh, we are concerned with the joint action of all the agents, which is represented by uh, this vector a1 to an and that uh, it belongs to the space of all the uh, actions of each of these individual agents uh, and then we have a reward function where the reward function of a particular agent depends on the actions of all the other agents uh, we have a transition function where the transition function depends on the actions of all agents and also a discount factor like the mdp right 
so now let me formally introduce uh, two different uh, mean field methods that is uh, being used in literature. And these are the two classic uh, mean field paradigms. Uh, the first paradigm is that of mean field reinforcement learning uh, from Yang et al. Uh, that is a very recent work being released in 2018. Uh, so Yang et al. considers the, the stochastic game as the foundational model. So they're not changing the foundational model. And uh, under stochastic games, now they consider n to be very large. So you just go back, uh, everything now is going, just going to be the same except that n is going to be very large, but n is still finite. We are not uh, saying n is going to be infinite. Um, so mean field here is an empirical action distribution represented by mu a. And the Q function, which is the multi-agent Q function that contains the actions of all the agents uh, in the environment, uh, can be linearly factorized using pairwise interactions. This is a theorem that Yang et al. shows, uh, but this is under some restrictive assumptions. I will uh, ha I have a separate slide about the assumptions, and uh, but let's let's uh, I just want to say now that under certain assumptions, you can show that the multi-agent Q function can be linearly factorized uh, using this uh, factorization, where instead of considering all the actions at the same time, you can just consider actions of the neighbors, uh, actions of all the individual other uh, agents in the environment. Uh, so that is represented by AK. So given this formulation, uh, Yang et al. showed on the result where they show that the multi-agent Q function can be uh, approximated using the mean field Q function. So this is the mean field approximation. So if you look at uh, this uh, approximation here, the, the uh, a Q value or the Q function on the left-hand side uh, has the actions of all the agents. So that is the giant action space. There's, this considers actions of all the agents of the environment. And the Q val function on the right-hand side only has the mean field, which is mu a. So the right hand side, uh, every uh, in the right hand side, all the agents are only responding to the mean field. But on the left hand side, the multi-agent Q function uh, requires a response to every other agent in the environment. So there's actual modeling of uh, individual agents. Uh, so the solution concept in uh, Yang et al is that of Nash equilibrium. So uh, there is uh, uh, so Yang et al proved uh, uh, found foundational. Uh, uh, guarantees of convergence in mean field reinforcement learning. However, th these were under some very restrictive assumptions. So actually these assumptions come from uh, learning in general some stochastic games from Hu and Wellman. Uh, so they've just reused uh, those assumptions and th this work from Hu and Wellman in 2003 has some really, uh, uh, really strong assumptions about the nature of stage games and Nash equilibrium. So under the same assumptions, Yang et al is able to prove convergence and Yang et al is also, uh, uh, but because they are using the Nash equilibrium, they also have some assumptions about about global uh, observations. So they assume that every agent can have global information and get strategies about every other agent in the environment. Uh, so the reason why Yang et al's work has become popular is because they have like three important experimental results where uh, they show good results on the icing model that I introduced before. And also they have like one uh, good result on this uh, battle game, which has a total of about 128 agents. So this is like a game where you have two teams of 64 agents and each agent is supposed to cooperate with uh, agents of the same team and compete against agents of the opponent team to uh, to be able to uh, provide winning strategies uh, to win this battle. And uh, Yang et al showed that the mean field algorithms is, is able to uh, defeat several other multi-agent algorithms in, in the literature. So uh, these uh, strong experimental results has, has made this work from Yang et al really popular. So the second uh, mean field paradigm that I'm interested in is that of uh, mean field games. So mean field games is the most popular, uh, the most classic uh, uh, mean field paradigm. This was introduced by Lastry and Lyons in 2007. Uh, so Lastry and Lyons consider a set of infinite independent agents. So the, the, the n that we had before is uh, infinite in the limit. Uh, so the mean field here is a population state distribution, different from Yang et al's work, which was population action distribution. Uh, so mean field games, in mean field games, uh, last three lines showed that when you have the number of agents to uh, to go to infinity in the limit, uh, you can actually uh, decompose or, or convert the underlying stochastic game model into a different model called as the mean field game model, uh, where the reward function or the transition function can just be represented based on the mean field. And, and you don't have to represent all the other giant actions anymore. Uh, the solution concept that last three lines provided was that of the mean field equilibrium. Uh, this is a, a variant of the Nash equilibrium, uh, which is uh, represented as a tuple, mu star, uh, uh, overline mu star, and pi star. Uh, and this is more of a recursive definition where pi star is a policy that all the agents play, and that is the best response to uh, the mean field overlying mu star. And mu star is a mean field when all the agents play the, the policy pi star. So this is a recursive definition. And uh, so just looking at the 
the equilibrium definition, you can see that it is, it is restrictive uh, because, uh, yeah, Lastrian lines uh, required that all these agents uh, learn the exact same pulse, exact same optimal policy in the limit, which will be pi star. So every agent literally has to play the same uh, policy pi star. And at the same time, pi star has to be the best response to the entire mean field uh, overline mu star, which is actually uh, a global information. So this is uh, like information about all the agents in the environment, which you can only obtain if you're sharing information across every other agent in the environment, uh, especially in this huge environment with almost millions of agents. Right. So uh, let me provide some, con uh, at least a couple of concrete examples about what the mean field is all about. So uh, the mean field in itself is actually a misnomer. It's not the case that we are really using a mean of anything. So the mean field is actually a distribution. It's, it's something like an empirical distribution. So in the case of discrete actions, uh, so the mean field is represented using this equation. Uh, we're uh, considering an example. Let's assume that you have four agents in the environment and you have four actions in the action space. And uh, each of this, the agent, the first um, representation shows that agent one is choosing action two, agent two is choosing action one, agent three is choosing action four, and agent four is choosing action three. So it's just written in a one hot fashion. Uh, and if you just sum out and take an empirical average, you get the mean field to be represented using this um, vector where uh, the first uh, uh, component shows, uh, the first component means that there is a 25% probability that one of the agents will choose action one, a 25% probability that one of the agents will choose action two and so on. So that's what the, the data represents. Uh, in the case of continuous actions, uh, the mean field is more like a probability density functions, uh, which can be seen as a mixture of direct delta distributions where uh, each of the agents actions can be represented as a, as a direct measure. Uh, so now let me just uh, specify the actual mean field assumptions, which I've been uh, claiming to be limiting so far. Uh, so these are the assumptions under which Lastrian Lyons, as well as Yang et al. Uh, developed their uh, mean field model. So mean field methods have three assumptions. Uh, the first assumption is that uh, mean field methods requires all agents to be independent, homogeneous, and distinguishable. So essentially this means that uh, you have a set of agents and all of these agents, uh, and if you can pick out any two agents in this list and you should be able to swap it and, and still not lose anything. Uh, this is only possible when and all the, all the agents have the same state space, the same action space, the same reward function, and they all have the same goals and, and, and so on. Uh, the second uh, assumption is that the global mean field is available. Uh, this is some global information that is not typically available in uh, multi-agent settings. So this is, um, so availability of global information requires sharing of information across all the different agents typically. And uh, having an assumption like of global information in a mean field paradigm with many agents is uh, actually limiting. The third assumption is that uh, agents perform no uh, operant modeling. The agents perform no per agent modeling. The only uh, response of the agent will provide is uh, to the mean field. There's only interactions with the mean field. So this uh, assumption is a consequence of another assumption which says that the number of agents are very, very large, almost infinite in the limit. So therefore, uh, each agent's impact on the environment is uh, very limited. Uh, so these three assumptions, especially the first two, uh, can be seen to be limiting applications of mean field learning. First is that we can only use mean field learning in cooperative settings simply because you need some global information. And this means that uh, agents should be able to share some information across each other. And uh, something like uh, indistinguishability or homogeneity means that agents should have the same goal, which also typically tends to be cooperative settings. Uh, so the other point I already mentioned, uh, so uh, so if I consider a real world setting like wildfire fighting, you can see why these assumptions are impractical. So uh, you have like a bunch of firefighters and each of them are typically tasked with some different objective in this space. So they, they don't they don't share objectives. And, and that is uh, one example where all of these things will fail. Uh, so if I just go back to, uh, the slide here where I talked about uh, the reward function or the transition function, typically in mean field games, uh, the agent indices are all dropped because they're all indistinguishable. But I just uh, use the agent indices here for continuity, but in mean field games, all the agent indices are dropped in across the across the board. Uh, <clears throat> right, so uh, let's, let, just to summarize everything that I've said so far, we have two different mean field paradigms in literature, mean field games from last three lines, MFRO from Yang et al. Uh, so, and we are introducing a new paradigm in this work, uh, which is called decentralized mean field game. And uh, the difference uh, is captured in this table here. Where the underlying model uh, is a mean field game for MFG, stochastic game for MFRO, and a decentralized mean field game for us. And the 
And the other major differences are that the mean field uh, has to be a state distribution or action distribution for other models, but our model is flexible and can accommodate everything. Uh, the action space and reward function needs to be the same for the other agents, and we will relax that assumption. We do not require homogeneity or indistinguishability. So for us, the action space or reward function can be different. Uh, so the mean field information requires global information and other methods, but uh, we can just make do with local information. Uh, the solution concept requires global information and other methods, but we can just make do with decentralized and local information. And uh, theoretical guarantees use some practical assumptions in the other methods, but we can provide uh, theoretical guarantees under some uh, under very practical considerations. Uh, so again, scale, um, uh, less assumptions, and theoretical groundedness under practical considerations. That's the core uh, points that I'm trying to uh, emphasize in this talk. Uh, so centralization and mean field methods can be typically seen in these three ways. Uh, I've uh, just mentioned this before, so I'm just putting it all in multi-agent reinforcement learning terminology. So there is centralization in information here, which is which means that you need some global information, and there is centralization in training, which means that you are you can actually. When implementing, you implement it by agents sharing parameters using the indistinguishability assumption and centralization and solution concept, where I argue that Nash equilibrium and mean field equilibrium are centralized uh, solution concepts because they require some global information and some knowledge of the strategies of other agents. Uh, so now I will actually introduce our work, which is decentralized mean field games, where I'll show how we relax the uh, two important assumptions of uh, mean field games. Uh, so decentralized mean field games. So the idea is to extend mean field methods to a paradigm where we are being fully decentralized. So we do not have any more centralization. Uh, from the set of assumptions we saw before, we relax the first two assumptions that uh, the agents are independent, homogeneous, and indistinguishable. The global mean field is available. Both of these are relaxed. Uh, the, but we'll still retain the third assumption. We'll just say that interactions are only going to be with the mean field. Uh, we provide a new solution concept, which is a decentralized solution concept, and this will be a, uh, this will be called the decentralized mean field equilibrium. So our uh, method, decentralized mean field game, can be uh, can be represented as a stuple, but S is the Cartesian product of all the state spaces of all the agents. A is the Cartesian product of action spaces of all the agents. R is the reward function that con that's, that contains a set of reward functions of all agents. So the important uh, point here is that agent indices are retained in our system. All agents can have their own independent action spaces, reward, reward functions, and so on. Uh, so we are considering the infinite population limit of the game. Uh, so the mean field here can this flexible can be either the state or the action distribution. Uh, we only use the local information throughout. Uh, and uh, the best responses here uh, will be to estimates of the actual mean field. So every agent will hold some estimate of the actual uh, mean field based on its local observations, and it will provide a response to that uh, mean field. And this is not to the global mean field as assumed by prior works. Uh, so the objective is to maximize discarded sum of uh, rewards as in any um, uh, model uh, problem. So the decentralized mean field equilibrium here can be represented again as a pair of uh, uh, pi star j and mu star j. So if you see, we have retained agent indices. And here, uh, pi star j is the best response to the mean field estimate mu star j. And mu star j is the mean field estimate when the agent plays the policy pi star j. So uh, you can see it's decentralized. We retain agent indices and we specify that agents can have their own, uh, they can learn their own best response policies. And uh, we don't require global uh, information for the, the solution concept. Uh, so using this solution concept and the formulation of decentralized mean field games, we have some uh, really strong theoretical results. Uh, so similar to the foundational theoretical results we have in other mean field systems, uh, we can show that uh, Markovian policies is sufficient for uh, decentralized mean field games. So this is a fundamental result in reinforcement learning, uh, where you can prove that uh, under Markovian assumptions, um, uh, just using memoryless policies is not going to lead to any loss of optimality. So similarly, we can we can show a similar result for decentralized mean field games. And uh, we can also show that decentralized mean field games admits the solution concept of decentralized mean field equilibrium. So such a point actually exists in the space of uh, decentralized mean field games. Uh, given these two first two theorems, we can actually consider an operator H, which is uh, uh, which which can be uh, decomposed into two other operators, H1 and H2, where H1 updates the Q function using a Bellman update, and H2 updates the mean field. Uh, 
so this is like a tableau update and using these tableau updates uh, we can show that under under tableau updates we can show that operator each is well defined which means that it maps from q uh, mu space to q mu space which is uh, the q value mean field space and we can also show that h is a contraction where the fixed point of contraction is actually a decentralized mean field equilibrium so we can show that under certain uh, uh, so under the uh, the decentralized mean field game paradigm, we can show that the the system uh, a, a Q uh, iteration method will actually converge to the solution concept. So uh, given these uh, theoretical results, let me provide some practical implementation details for for the decentralized mean field games. Uh, so I have I just go back to the update techniques in uh, one particular uh, 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 mean field paradigm, which is mean field reinforcement learning from Yang et al. And I will list their update equations, and I will list my update equations, and I will see I will show how our update equations are a lot more practical. Uh, so the first update is the update of the Q function uh, in Yang et al. The Q function is updated using a TD Bellman backup. But uh, the important uh, detail is that the Q function uses the global state space, and it uses the global mean field. So both the global information is required. So the value function uses the expectation of the Q function, and that also uses all the same global information. Uh, the mean field update requires, uh, uh, so it, it just takes the empirical average of all the agents actions as I showed in the example, but the actions of all the agents is sampled from the policy of each of the agents, and this requires knowledge of the policies of all the other agents. Uh, and the Boltzmann policy also uses uh, the, the mean field and the same mean field from the previous step. Uh, so here, seeing the mean field and Boltzmann uh, policy updates, if, if you uh, analyze these two equations carefully, uh, you will see that there is a chicken and egg problem here. Uh, this, there is a chicken and egg problem because in the first, in the third equation here, uh, the mean field requires the policy to be uh, uh, to be updated, and uh, the fourth equation, the policy requires the mean field to be to be updated. So because they are just interdependent, uh, there is a chicken and egg problem. And Yang et al. simply uh, uh, simply uh, adjusted this problem by assuming that uh, the policy can just be a response to the previous mean field. So uh, just calculate the mean field, update the policy uh, using the previous mean field, and then uh, update the actual mean field. That's that's the strategy that they give. Uh, but this uh, can lead to a loss in performance because uh, the agents are actually uh, uh, responding to the previous mean field and not to the current mean field. All the theory, all the system has been developed assuming that you can uh, you can respond to the actual mean field, but uh, in practice, the agents are responding to the previous mean field. Uh, so the decentralized mean field update that we provide has a, a Q function update in a very similar fashion, where we have uh, the, a TD Bellman update, but we here we only use local information. So agents uses its own local state, as well as the mean field of uh, uh, the local mean field that the agent is maintaining. This is the estimate of the mean field that the agent is maintaining. So the value function also uses just local information. Uh, the mean field update actually uses a predictor uh, represented by F, where uh, the inputs, so this predictor in practice, uh, in, in our experiments, we just use a neural network uh, to denote the predictor. And the predictor uses the state and uh, mean field information the previous time step to predict the mean field of the current time step. And uh, using this predictor, uh, the, the mean field that you have predicted for the next time step is used for the Boltzmann policy update. So the Boltzmann policy is actually giving a best response to the current mean field. Uh, and not to the previous mean field as done in Yang et al. And we do not have a chicken and egg problem in our updates. Uh, so practically, these update equations can be um, uh, can be used to uh, define uh, a reinforcement learning update. So if you just recursively update all the four equations, you you can have uh, you can have a tabular algorithm. Uh, but to extend this to uh, large state spaces and action spaces, we use some function approximation. Uh, uh, we use the neural networks as is done in common practice. Uh, so we use some empirical tricks that has been introduced by DQN. So we, we have used a separate target network and we use a replay buffer. Uh, so we have two uh, Q networks for every agent, the evaluation network and the target network. And we also have a mean field network, which will act as a predictor. Uh, and for every experience that the agent obtains, uh, it observes the local mean field and uses that to update its uh, network uh, that is predicting the mean field, and then it stores the experience tuple. And after a finite number of update steps, it will, after a finite uh, a number of experiences are collected, it will update the evaluation and target nets as done by uh, DQN. So we also have a similar actor critique update, and uh, the actor critique updates, yes. So there is a question. Yes, James. Hi. Um... So am I right to think you never actually observe the mean field, right? This is this is something that you are inferring based on your knowledge of the dynamics. 
you do not observe the overall mean field, just like the global mean field. Uh, but you observe something at every time step. So at every time step, you have an observation of the neighborhood and uh, you, you observe some agents in the neighborhood uh, and you update, you uh, calculate an estimate of the mean field based on your observations. I see. So I get to see what some of the agents did and that's right. kind of like my notion of mean field. And do I have right. some, how everybody's actions are related or I, I'm, you know, I'm assuming that everybody, no. okay. Okay. No, so this entire paradigm is going to be uh, a local paradigm. So we are looking at local optimization. We are looking at convergence to a local equilibrium. So everything is going to be uh, uh, in, a, in a localized fashion. The, the analysis is happening in a localized fashion. Okay, so if there's some agent that has a, har a large impact on my utility or on my reward, um, but I don't see them. You know, if there's some... right. So that is the assumption. So that's why uh, I mentioned this here. So when we go back to the assumptions, so we uh, retain this assumptions, which say that the interaction is only with the mean field. Uh, which means that um, every agent's impact on the global environment is still infinitesimal. So you cannot have like, you cannot have a system where you have one agent, which is like, a, so in mean field, there's a particular line of study called major agent. Right, right. Agent. No, I, I got you. So, but, so, you can have, sorry. Right. so I'm going to change my question to there's a measure one mass of agents that I can't observe who are changing mm -hmm. the global mean field. So is it the mm -hmm. case? Your assumption is a little bit more restrictive than that. It's not just the global mean field that affects me. In fact, it's literally only the local mean field that matters to me. So if I can't see you, you can't hurt me. Is that? No. So we don't have an assumption like that. Okay. So what we are saying is um, whatever you observe, you will maintain a distribution based on that. And you will take an action based on that. And just because you cannot observe the global properties, uh, this is going to increase your approximation error. So we provide approximation bounds based on what you cannot see. I see. Uh, okay. So, yeah. So, so, so you right. you will you will lose optimality. Right. Yeah, yeah, you will lose optimality. You will lose optimality, but this is the best you can do. So that's right. that's why we are saying I'm saying we are a practical. Uh, we are just being more practical in that uh, way. All right. Thanks very much. Right. right. Uh, yeah. So I was talking about um, the actor critic update. So we have a very similar scheme, uh, but we just use an actor critic update where uh, we update the critic using a TD error and the actors using a log loss. And we have a very similar uh, algorithm as the Q learning, uh, mesh, uh, Q learning method. So given these two algorithms that we introduce, uh, we have a series of empirical results. Uh, so we have a series of uh, empirical results on uh, two settings. One is simulated setting and the other is a real world setting. Uh, so in the, in the simulated setting, we consider two different simulators. Uh, the first is the M-agent simulator, which supports uh, many agent learning. And this uh, uses a discrete action space and, it, you, and this can use uh, several different uh, domains. And the battle domain that I talked about before falls under this simulator. Uh, the second uh, simulator, the SISL simulator, which uses a continuous action space. So in the discrete case, we use three baselines, uh, independent like Q learning, uh, MFQ and MFAC. MFQ and MFAC comes from the Yang et al's work. And the SISL simulator uh, uses two different uh, baselines for continuous uh, control, which is PPU and DDPG. Uh, so we, we have three uh, simulated settings. The first setting is uh, the battle setting, the same as what I introduced before. Here we have two teams of 25 agents each. Uh, uh, we have like about, uh, we have we have a set of homogeneous agents with discrete actions. Uh, now we are going to say the setting is partially observable. This is different from Yang et al's work, which, which are had fully observable uh, properties. Uh, and we have two phase of experimentation, training and execution. Uh, so combined nouns domain is very similar to battle domain, except that the two uh, teams are heterogeneous. So each agent has different types of, uh, uh, each team has different types of agents. Uh, we're arranged and melee, uh, the two types of agents. So uh, each agent has 15, each team has 15 ranged agents and 10 melee agents. The ranged are faster and can, can attack further and the melee are slower, but they are more powerful. Um, so we have another setting, which is the water world domain from SISO. Uh, again, we have 25 agents, and this is a continuous action space. Uh, it's a fully cooperative setting where agents are trying to collect uh, food and avoid poison. So we have two phases of training and execution. So we have uh, the first uh, set of results on the battle domain, uh, where we show that uh, during training as well as execution, uh, DMFGQL and DMFGAC, the two methods that we introduce, uh, provides a better performance than the three baselines, um, mostly due to uh, the chicken and egg, uh, addressing the chicken and egg problem, being using less restrictive assumptions and uh, being theoretically grounded. Uh, so the combined arms domains also, we have the same uh, properties. We do not uh, use the Yang et al's um, 
uh, uh, equal Iyang et al's algorithms because they are not for heterogeneous spaces. So we leave out MFQ and MFAC here. Uh, so water world domain also we see that the decentralized mean field update that uses the mean field provides the best uh, performance across training and execution. Uh, so now we have an, another interesting real world problem that we tackle uh, using our updates. So we consider a right pool matching problem. Uh, so here this is a kind of problem that Uber pool or Lyft line would be interested in. And the data set is coming from a real world New York yellow taxi data set. And we simulate different kind of situations using uh, this data set for training. Uh, so we vary the capacity of a set of vehicles. We simulate a set of taxis, and then we have a set of uh, ride requests. And the ride request is coming from the ride, New York yellow taxi data set. Uh, so we simulate different settings where we vary the capacity of vehicles, we vary the number of vehicles, and we vary the maximum pickup delay. Uh, so here I present the results uh, from the execution phase or the validation phase. Uh, so we use two different uh, baselines, new ADP. Uh, new ADP is just a variant of DQN. So that's an independent technique that does not use the main field. Uh, CU is just a combinatorial optimization technique. So that does not use the, uh, that, that does not consider delayed rewards. That, that is only considering the current rewards. Uh, and DMFGQL is the decentralized mean field technique that also considers the mean field. Uh, so we vary the number of vehicles. Uh, so across uh, 80, 100 to 120 vehicles, we see that uh, DMFJQL provides the best performance, and uh, we also have a single day test uh, where we have where we sh uh, see the where we study the service rate, which is the amount of ride requests that is uh, fulfilled, the ratio of ride requests that have been fulfilled, uh, and we see that DMFJQL provides the best performance. Uh, we also vary the other parameters, uh, the number of vehicles and the maximum pickup delay. Uh, so if you, if your capacity of your vehicles is larger, then obviously you'll be able to satisfy more requests. But but even in that setting, DMFGQL provides the best uh, result. And if you can actually, if uh, the passengers can wait longer for their uh, uh, rides, then again you can uh, you can uh, service more requests. But again, uh, DMFGQL provides the best performance across the baselines. Uh, so what we have been able to achieve in this work is uh, a full decentralization in mean field games. Uh, we have been able to relax the three uh, assumptions of centralization that we had before. Uh, we do not need any more centralization in information or centralization in training or centralization in solution concept. All these three uh, properties have been relaxed. Uh, so let me just uh, conclude using uh, uh, saying some uh, avenues for future work and some conclusion summary points. Uh, so our, for theoretically, we, we have some contributions across both theoretical as well as empirical spaces. Uh, theoretically, we have been able to define a suitable uh, uh, mean field paradigm and have a suitable decentralized solution concept and also shown fundamental uh, properties like convergence to a fixed point in this uh, particular paradigm. Uh, empirically, we provided practical algorithms. Uh, we showed better performances than baselines. Uh, we showed that you can resolve a chicken and egg problem in Yang et al. Uh, we showed that we can have results across a wide range of domains, especially the right pool matching uh, domain. So uh, future work from here uh, will, from the theoretical side, uh, be restricted ourselves to tabular methods, uh, analyzing function approximation, uh, and uh, will be useful. Uh, and also we restricted ourselves to Q-learning methods, analyzing actor critique methods will also be useful here. Uh, empirically, we can think of other real world problems, autonomous driving, smart grid utility management, uh, and, and look for deployment of these uh, mean field solutions. Okay, so just to provide a, a, a large background about myself, uh, this could be a good feeder to the discussion here. Uh, so like Matt introduced uh, me, I'm uh, fundamentally interested in multi-agent problems. I'm fundamentally interested in multi-agent reinforcement learning. And I'm very passionate about uh, deploying multi-agent reinforcement learning solutions in the real world. Uh, uh, towards this, I have actually tackled two uh, fundamental problems in multi-agent reinforcement learning during my PhD. Uh, the first problem that I looked at is uh, the problem of sample efficiency in multi-agent reinforcement learning. So multi-agent reinforcement learning, even though it's good, it's, it's very, very slow. So I addressed uh, sample efficiency using uh, action advising techniques. The second third of my research uh, considered the problem of scaling multi-agent algorithms using mean field learning. And here uh, we have three uh, important uh, algorithms that we have provided. Uh, the first is multi-type method for uh, introducing heterogeneous agents. The second is partially observable mean field reinforcement learning. Incidentally, I actually gave a presentation in the Alberta AI seminar last year about these two methods, um, multi-type method and the partially observable mean field methods. And I know some of you attended that. Uh, if not, uh, the, I think the, the talk is on YouTube. So uh, you are free to check it out. Uh, and also the decentralized mean field method is uh, what I presented now. Uh, I'm currently working on some methods that can combine these two different threads of my research. Uh, 
Right, so I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you for uh, your attention. And I have some important links on this uh, slide that pertain to the paper and the code. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Wonderful, Sriram. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, anyone, if you have questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask Sriram direct, directly. Otherwise, you can also type in your questions in the chat box and I'll be happy to read those to Sriram. Hey, Sriram, I have a question. I, I didn't fully follow, I think, some of the assumptions that you might have been making or how they changed as they went from, you know, mean field games, the distributed mean field games. But maybe, maybe you can, rather than trying to poke at exactly what the assumptions are, maybe you can help me understand them this way. It feels like you, your decentralized mean field games feel relatively close to things like deck POM DPs and deck MDPs. And we know we have hardness on those results, but you're saying I have a contraction mapping. So like you, you don't have hardness, you can get approximate solutions and, you know, like in essentially polynomial time and things that we might care about and deck MDPs and deck POM DPs, we know that's not possible. So, so maybe, maybe you can say like, what the, what is the assumption you're making that, that lets you get past those hardness results? Yeah, so we have some contraction and uh, uh, fixed point guarantees, sorry. Sorry, we have these uh, kind of uh, guarantees, especially to a local optimum. And uh, fundamentally, I would like to argue that the setting that we are considering is different from a deck form DP setting, uh, because in a deck form DP, uh, the, the first, the first uh, uh, difference is, lies from the, the nature of the environment itself. So here we have uh, one um, a critical assumption of mean field that we retain. So uh, we still specify that each agent's impact on the global environment is, is going to be negligible. Uh, so every agent is uh, uh, just uh, going to use, uh, just going to respond to the mean field and they are going to respond to some, uh, 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 they are going to respond to some estimate of their, their mean field. So uh, that is, uh, uh, so that, that's why we are in this mean field setting, which is different from a deck form DP work where in, in deck form DP, we have decentralization, but you have other kind of assumptions on the nature of the environment itself, like uh, agents share their work functions and, uh, uh, and so on. So we do not have such assumptions on the decentralized uh, mean field game setting. Uh, and uh, regarding the theoretical results, like I said, uh, we have results uh, about convergence to the local optimum. And uh, some of, all of these results come from uh, some strong assumptions that we uh, generally technically, we generally take in the mean field setting. So uh, these assumptions relate to the nature of uh, the different uh, uh, functions. Like one uh, assumption that is very common in mean field st uh, studies that we have also considered is the assumption of Lipschitz continuity. So we we assume that the, the the all the all the functional spaces here are Lipschitz continuous, uh, and we also have certain assumptions on the the uh, the nature of the. Uh, the nature of uh, uh, the nature of the curves here, uh, like the the restrictions on uh, uh, like an abound on the reward functions and and uh, uh, the 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 type of uh, so we have some assumptions on convexity and and uh, being. Uh, and and having like uh, uh, having uh, having a gradient and so on. So uh, fundamentally, the type of assumptions that we make and and, and the entire system uh, uh, differs significantly from the deck form DP setting. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, if not, then let's thank Sriram for a wonderful presentation and engaging discussion. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Matt is clapping for Sriram. Good job. Uh, thank you everyone for joining in today. And uh, please stay safe. We'll see you in, in, the, uh, in next week's AI seminar. Till then, stay safe. Bye-bye everyone. Mm -hmm.